do you think are the hardest people to reach with the gospel of Jesus Christ? Did you answer Muslims, Hindus, Buddhists? What about atheists? We'll find out how Dr. J. Vernon McGee answers that question on Through the Bible. I'm Steve Schwetz, your host and fellow passenger on the Bible bus, and I'm so glad that you're here as we open our Bibles to the book of Ezekiel at chapter 2. But before we get started, here's Dr. McGee with an introduction to our passage. Here in this second chapter, God says to Ezekiel, he says, now I want you to bring a message to the house of Israel, but very candidly, they're not going to hear you. That is, they won't believe you, they won't accept it, but you're to do it. And he said, God says, that's all right. He says, they don't believe me either. And I feel that we today are cast in very much that kind of a role in the day in which we live. It's a day when many are hearing the Word of God, and we rejoice in that, but many do not hear the Word of God. And what about that? Well, Paul says that we are savor of life unto those that are saved, and a savor of death unto those that are lost. In other words, there are going to be a whole lot of people that listen to this program that are going to do nothing about it, and actually, the gospel is going to condemn them instead of saving them, because they'd never be able to go into the presence of God and say, look, I never heard it at all. But many are responding. And right now we are in the thick of a theological debate or discussion or controversy, whatever you happen to want to call it, in this country. What really happens when a person is born again? We've been talking about that so long. What are the steps, if there are steps in it? It's the first thing that takes place. You believe and how can a lost man who has no capacity for God, they've all gone out of the way. Each one's turned to his own way. There's none that seeketh after God. That's the condition of any lost person. It is the condition of you. If today you're a Christian, you at one time had no desire for God. That certainly was my condition a time when I had no desire for God. Well, what is the first step? Well, we're going to be saying a great deal about this later on, but right now let me say this, that I think that the first step is conviction, and that conviction comes from hearing the Word of God. And that's the thing that's important. Ezekiel had a tough job as we're going to see. And just like today, God's Word is talking to many hard hearts. So let's pray together for those that we know who need to be convicted by the Word of God. Heavenly Father, open our hearts to hear your message and to reveal to us what you want us to hear from your Word, and then soften our hearts and give us ears to hear what you want to say to us. We ask this with confidence in Jesus' name. Amen. Open up your Bible to Ezekiel chapter 2 as we make our way through the Bible with Dr. J. Vernon McGee. Now, friends, today our study brings us to the second chapter of Ezekiel. We just got started there in this book, and we are through that first chapter with that glorious vision. And we'll be returning to it because that vision is probably the high water mark in the Word of God. I believe that all the visions in Scripture, rests upon that vision. I do know this, that that vision forms the basis of every vision in Ezekiel, and that a great deal of the book of Revelation does not rest primarily on Daniel and actually on the Olivet Discourse of our Lord. Yet the book of Revelation needs to be considered with the Olivet Discourse and the book of Daniel but that which is really foundational is the book of Ezekiel, the apocalypse here of Ezekiel. And this great vision, which we'll return to from time to time, and I felt so inadequate dealing with it last time, we just actually stand on the fringe of things, and we cannot penetrate. Why? Because you're dealing with the infinite God. And friends, all we can do is stand there and worship and praise his name. Now, this vision had a tremendous effect upon Ezekiel. As we found out, it was the Old Testament custom. When men got into the presence of God, they went down on their faces. That was true of 
Isaiah, you remember that he says, I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. And he said he had unclean lips. And this man found himself horizontal with the ground. He was not perpendicular with it. And he could say, I'm undone. And that was the position Daniel took also. And it was a position John took on the Isle of Patmos. John says, I fell at his feet as dead. And so we open chapter 2 with verse 1. It reads like this. He said unto me, Son of man, stand upon thy feet, and I'll speak unto thee. Apparently he wasn't standing up. He was down on his face. Now he receives a call and commission here and and endowment with power for the office that God has called him to. And you notice the way that God addresses him, son of man. That's interesting because this is a title that is found exactly 100 times here in Ezekiel. And you find also Daniel is called the son of man, the only two in the Old Testament that were called that. And this is the title that the Lord Jesus appropriated to himself 86 times. In the New Testament, we find him using this title for himself. Now, it speaks of him in his rejection, his humiliation, and also his exaltation. And so you have his suffering and his humiliation, his exaltation, and the glory of him and his second coming. He's the Son of Man. And I think Ezekiel passed through a great deal of suffering. If you would ask me whose position would you rather have, or let me turn it around, which position would you rather not have of Daniel, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel? And I would say Ezekiel. Now, Daniel was in danger, it's true, in the court. And if you doubt that, ask the lions down there in the den, because this man Daniel spent a night with them And if God hadn't intervened, why, this man Daniel would have been lying food. But he survived it, but he was in danger down there in a foreign court. But I'd much prefer his job. At least he had luxury quarters, and he stayed in the best motel that there was in Babylon. That was the palace of the king. And Jeremiah, at this time, is pretty much retired And he's up with the remnant. Now, he was in grave danger during his active ministry until the deportation of the people in captivity. But now this man, Ezekiel, is sent to do a hard job. And I mean a difficult job, friends. He had the job of speaking to an apostate people, to those that were in rebellion against God, to those that thought they were God's people, and Frankly, the Spirit of God now comes upon him here and prepares him for this office. I'm now reading verse 2. And the Spirit entered into me when he spoke unto me and set me upon my feet that I heard him who spoke unto me. The Spirit of God now endues him with power for the office. Now, I believe that when God called you to do a job, He'll give you the power to do that job. In fact, I think God's work can only be done with the power of God. That ought to be self-evident. If God has called you to do a certain thing, he'll give you the power to do it. And if you recognize you can't do it, that's the best position you can come to. Moses, you remember, finally came to the position after 40 years in the wilderness, he couldn't deliver the people. Now, God says, I can do it through you. And God called him to do it, and he was able to do it, not because there was anything in Moses, but because there was a great deal in God. And I think that today is so practical that it works in the ministry, it works in the pew, it works in the mission field today. I remember a young couple, they came to me, they were called to go to the mission field, they said. I'll be very frank with you, I questioned them, and I was criticized because I very frankly felt that they were not called, but I didn't know it, and I certainly wasn't going to stand in the way. 
And they went to the mission field. They came back a casualty. Well, it was tragic. And when I talked with them, they came into council. And so I was talking with them. They were bitter. Now, God had let them down. They were willing to go to the mission field, willing to be martyrs. And yet God wouldn't use them. And I said, had it ever occurred to you that if you'd been called to the mission field, he'd have given you the power to do the job? Well, they had never thought of it from that viewpoint. My friend, we need to recognize that and make sure if we're called to God that he's going to give us the power to do it. Then, therefore, the important thing is to make sure that we're called to God to do the thing. And so this man is called to God. I'll be honest with you. He was called to the hardest task any man that I can think of is this man, Ezekiel. Now, will you notice, God's going to tell him about his job. And I'm of the opinion, if he told me this, when I entered the ministry, I'd have said, well, now, wait a minute, Lord, you already have my resignation. I think I'm going to continue on being a bank clerk and try to work myself up there. Well, I'm glad he didn't tell me because I must confess I'm a coward and I come from a long line of cowards. But this man, Ezekiel, I admire him. Will you notice what God said to him? He said unto me, son of man, I send thee to the children of Israel, to a rebellious nation that hath rebelled against me. They and their fathers have transgressed against me even unto this day. They are impudent children and stiff-hearted. I do send thee unto them, and thou shalt say unto them, Thus saith the Lord. Now, this is tremendous. God says to this man, He says, now I'm going to send you to these people, and they are a rebellious nation. That is the most tremendous statement that you find here. Now, the word rebellious here, that occurs again and again in this book. These people were in rebellion against God, and they are called a nation. Now, the word for nation here is not the word God generally used for them, his chosen people. The word here is goyim, and that's the word that Israel used for the Gentile, for the pagan, the heathen, if you please. Now what has happened? The nation Israel has sunk down to the level of the heathen that are round about them. And God says they are a rebellious nation, and they've rebelled against me, and they're impudent children. And friends, the hardest people in the world to reach today with the gospel are church members. Those that are in the church that are actually in rebellion against God, they have rejected the gospel. They've actually rejected the word of God. And there are many in the church like that. And they think Christianity is being nice little girls and boys. You know, they play at church. It's a nice game. They want to be nice and sweet and keep their nose clean. And they want to live a life on the surface that is a very sedate and comfortable life. And they just don't want someone coming in and telling them they're lost sinners and they need to be saved and become obedient unto God. They are hard people to reach. Now, some of us have had a ministry that's been in today the modern church. And very candidly, I'm delighted I'm a retired preacher right now. And my heart goes out to my brethren today in the ministry. Some of them are really are sitting in a, in a hot seat. And unless my young friend, you're definite about your call, if I was you, I'd sell insurance or maybe try to do something else today rather than enter the ministry because it's not easy. That is, if you're going to stand for the word of God. Now, will you notice, here is what God says to him. Verse 5, And they, whether they will hear, or whether they will forbear, for they are rebellious house, yet shall know that there hath been a prophet among them. And Ezekiel, I'm calling you to go to them, and whether they hear you or whether they don't, they're going to know after your ministry. There was a prophet of God among them because I'm going to make that sure. And I think God does that today. To be very frank with you, I just want it said after I've gone, well, this boy, the best he could, he preached the word of God. That's the important thing. He says, I just want you to 
be sure that when you're gone, they'll be able to say, well, he was a prophet of God. There's no question about that, though we disagreed with him. Now, he says to this man, thou son of man, be not afraid of them. Apparently, he was in danger. Neither be afraid of their words, though briars and thorns be with thee, and thou dost dwell among scorpions. Be not afraid of their words, nor be dismayed at their looks, though they are a rebellious house. My, the Lord lays it on the line. Now I'm going to move on down to the third chapter, because in the third chapter here, you have the preparation of the prophet now for a hard job, a difficult assignment. Now, Jeremiah was a different type individual. Jeremiah, the prophet of the broken heart, with the tears streaming down his eyes. God needed that man to let his people know at that crucial moment that it was breaking his heart to send him into captivity. But now they've gone into captivity, and they are bitter. They are rebellious. In fact, the matter is, at this time, the temple in Jerusalem was not burned. The city was not destroyed. It wasn't until seven years after this delegation got there. And the false prophets were still telling them, you're going to go home, you're God's people. And they said to this man, Ezekiel, who do you think you are to tell us? We're God's people. We're going back. We're not going to be in captivity a long time. And Ezekiel, God says, you'd tell them they're not going back. They're going to be in captivity a long time, 70 years. Jeremiah was accurate. You're going to be there 70 years, and it's going to be hard working there on the canals. Those people, I think, worked in the fields. I think they built buildings. It was a hard lot. Now, he says in chapter 3, verse 1, Moreover, he said unto me, Son of man, see the title he gives him in his hard job, in his suffering. Eat what thou findest. Eat this scroll and go speak unto the house of Israel. Now, that's quite a diet, but he's to eat the word of God. That is, the word of God should become part of us, friend. No man ought to preach today if his heart is not in it. And he doesn't believe every word he says. And if he doesn't, he ought to get out of the ministry. The pulpit is no place for flowery speech and high-flown verbiage and excess verbiage at that. The pulpit is the place to declare the word of God. Now, he says to him, you eat the word of God. And so I open my mouth, Ezekiel says, and he caused me to eat that scroll. That's verse 2. Now I'm reading verse 3. And he said unto me, Son of man, eat and fill thy stomach. Get a good diet. Study the word of God. And fill thy stomach with this scroll that I give thee. Then did I eat it, and it was in my mouth like honey for sweetness. May I say to you, we've asked the question time and again, do you love the person of Christ? Maybe I ought to go back to that. Do you love the word of God? You'd never love him unless you love the word of God. And my feeling today, it's not really the attitude toward the book when you get it down to the final analysis. One seminary professor said to me some time ago, he says, what theory of inspiration do you hold? Well, I said to him, the theory I hold is no theory at all. I love the book. <laughs> you have to love the Word of God before it'll ever become meaningful to you. Then the Word of God reveals a person, and then you fall in love with him. Ezekiel said, I love the word, <laughs> but you sure got a hard job. Now he said unto me, son of man, go, get thee unto the house of Israel. Speak with my words unto them, for thou art not sent to a people of a strange speech. You're not sent to foreigners, your own people. You speak their language. You don't have to go as a missionary and learn a foreign tongue and a hard language, but to the house of Israel, not to many people of a strange speech and of a hard language, whose words thou canst not understand. Surely had I sent thee to them, they would have hearkened unto thee. Now, he's not like Paul the apostle, sent as a missionary to foreign people. Now he says, but the house of Israel will not hearken unto thee. This is verse 7. Oh, follow this carefully if you have your Bible. But the house of Israel will not hearken unto thee, for they will not hearken unto me. For all the house of Israel are impudent, hard-hearted, 
Behold, I have made thy face strong against their faces, and thy forehead strong against their foreheads. Like an adamant, harder than flint, have I made thy forehead. Fear them not, neither be dismayed at their looks, though they are a rebellious house. Now he says to this man, Ezekiel, Ezekiel, I'm going to send you to a congregation that they're impudent, they're in rebellion against me, they won't hear me, they're not going to hear you either. But you're to give them my word. But I'm going to make your head hard. Now, he didn't do that, this man Jeremiah. Jeremiah had a soft heart. And he couldn't stand up against it. Do you remember? He went and resigned at one time. Believe me, Ezekiel's not about to resign. God says, I'm going to make your head hard. The children of Israel are hard-headed, and I'll make your head harder than they are. And a man came to me, he says, you know, our preacher, I tell you, he really talked to the board the other night. And I don't think a preacher ought to talk that way to the board. Well, I said, what kind of board was it? Well, he says they've caused him a lot of trouble. Well, I said, that's the kind of problem that Ezekiel had. But I said, God made his head harder. And I just hope your preacher's head's going to be harder than anybody on the board. May I say to you, friends, this man's got a tough assignment. Now he's going to tell him what he's to do. Verse 15, Then I came to them of the captivity of Tel Abid, that dwelt by the river of Kibar, and I sat where they sat, and remained there, overwhelmed among them seven days. And it came to pass at the end of seven days that the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, I've made thee a watchman under the house of Israel. Therefore hear the word of my mouth, and give them warning from me. When I say unto the wicked, Thou shalt surely die, and thou givest him not warning, nor speakest to warn the wicked from his wicked way, to save his life, the same wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at thine hand. But if thou warn the wicked, and he turns not from his wickedness, nor from his wicked way, he shall die in his iniquity, but thou hast delivered thy soul. Now he's to be made a watchman, and that is a tremendous job. We're going to have occasion to refer to that again, and I want to say something about the watchman. But the important thing for us to note here is this man is to be a watchman to warn God's people. And they may not want it, but he's to warn them. And God says, I'll hold you responsible. If you don't warn them, they're going to die in their sin, and I'm going to hold you responsible. Now, if you warn them and they go ahead, they'll die in their sin, but you won't be responsible. You know, my friend, a man today that's a minister who does not give out the word of God in this hour, I'd hate to be in his position and stand before God the Lord Jesus someday in judgment. I believe that will probably be the most frightful judgment of all. A man who have had the word of God and then not have, well, let me use the refined term, the intestinal fortitude to declare the word of God. That was the responsibility of this man, and God chose the right man, Ezekiel, for the job. He is as hard as a hickory nut, let me tell you. We're going to see him now as we go through this book. Until next time, may God richly bless you, my beloved. We all know someone who needs to hear the truth of God's Word and the hope that we have in Jesus. And to make it easier for you to share His Word with those that you're praying to reach, we invite you to ask someone to hop aboard the Bible bus with us. Listening is easy. You can have them download our app or visit ttb.org and check out the many other great ways this program's available. You can also request a free pack of our Bible bus passes to hand out by calling 1-800-65-BIBLE. Now next, we offer quite a few resources available to help people understand what it means to have a relationship with God. Just go to ttb.org and search for How to Know God. There you'll find several free resources by Dr. McGee that you can listen to, you can download and share. Or we can send a few by mail. If you prefer, just give us a call. Again, 1-800-65-BIBLE or email us at biblebus at ttb.org. And if you'd like to be in touch by mail, 
Right to Box 7100, Pasadena, California, 91109. In Canada, Box 25325, London, Ontario, N6C, 6B1. Next time, the Bible Bus continues our journey through Ezekiel. I'm Steve Schwetz, and I'll meet you here. And it's great to be on this adventure with you in God's Word. We're grateful for our committed listening family who faithfully pray and invest in Through the Bible as we together take the whole word to the whole world.